the obviously the, the drugs was coming across the channel in a in a rib, you know, a semi rigid inflatable. And um, that's, that's it, obviously Essex is an easy route across. Eventually, the man calmed down and reluctantly gave his name, Michael Steele. When no one reacted, no one instantly reached for the handcuffs. He seemed almost surprised. Just after 2.30am, on the 8th of November 1995, Essex Police Constables Crick and Cohen were called to Felixstowe Ferry Car Park to investigate a report of three men landing a boat in suspicious circumstances. The pair arrived to find a blue D-Reg Range Rover attached to a trailer with a large inflatable boat on it in the car park close to the sailing club. The side lights of the Range Rover were on and the doors were open but there was no one around. PC Cohen was examining the vehicle, making a note of the large iron bar that had been placed between the front seats, when a someone came running over from the direction of the sea defences. Oh, said the man, slowing down when he realised that he was dealing with two policemen. I thought someone was trying to steal my motor. So all these items belong to you, do they, sir? asked PC Crick. Well, the boat is, but the Range Rover belongs to my brother. We've just been out diving, me, my brother and Gordon Stevens. You just missed my brother. He drove off about ten minutes ago. He's got all the wetsuits and diving gear with him. Diving? In the middle of the night? What's the point? You can't see anything. The man scratched his head for a second. Well, the thing is, the water's not that clear anyway. So it's just as good as night as it is during the day. But anyway, we didn't get much diving in. We had a bit of trouble with the boat. That's why we're out so late. I see. And what would your name be, sir? asked PC Crick. Wombs, came the reply. Jack Wombs. Just then a second man appeared by the slope over the embankment, but vanished again as soon as he saw what was going on. PC Cohen rushed over to try and find him. At the top of the slope, he looked to his left and saw lights on in a wooden beach cabin. He could see a man standing by the window looking at him and walked to have a word. The man identified himself as Gordon Stevens and, according to Cohen, behaved in a way that looked evasive and uncomfortable. He said he'd helped a couple of people who'd have difficulty with their boat on the sandbank but didn't know their names. PC Cohen asked if he could look inside the house to see if anybody was there. Stevens refused. By now, other police officers were starting to arrive and they escorted the two men who'd been hovering around the nearby sand dunes to PC Cohen. Both men refused to give their names. One of them was in a furious mood. Why the hell have you surrounded this bloke's house with police officers? He hasn't done anything wrong. This is his home for fuck's sake. Don't you people have any respect? Eventually, the man calmed down and reluctantly gave his name. Michael Steele. When no one reacted, no one instantly reached for the handcuffs. He seemed almost pleased. As far as the police were concerned, he wasn't one of the men who had been in the boat with Jack Wombs. He clearly knew Gordon Stevens but that was the only connection they could come up with. He was pretty much free to do what he wanted. Once Steele had relented and given his name, the man who was with him finally agreed to do the same. He was Peter Corey. The police now concentrated their efforts on Wombs. It was his boat after all, and they needed his permission in order to search it. Nothing was found, so Wombs was told to wait until the custom officers arrived, while Steele and Corey simply wandered in and out of Stephen's house chatting quietly to one another. With hindsight, it might have seemed a little naive, but at the time the officers at the scene thought they were doing the right thing. There didn't appear to be anything in the boat, and although the men were acting a little suspiciously, there really didn't seem to be anything going on. When Steele asked if he could start cleaning the boat to prevent the salt deposits building up on it, they saw no reason to say no to him. And so it was that customs officers arrived some 20 minutes later and saw their sworn enemy, the man they had vowed would never make them look stupid again, washing down his flashy new boat with a bucket of hot soapy water that still got the treatment he'd been expecting all night long. There was a chorus of screams, Get that man the fuck away from that boat! And Steele and the others were dragged away in handcuffs. At 4.25am, Steele, Worms and Corey were all arrested for being concerned in the importation of drugs. The process of gathering evidence against them began. Back in Basildon, Tony Tucker 
was having a sleepless night. He wasn't worried about stealing the drugs. As far as he was concerned at the time, everything was going according to plan and his little £15,000 investment was about to double in value. Tucker was nervous because the previous evening he'd performed the ultimate act of friendship. He'd given Pat Tate the keys to his black Porsche so he and his new girlfriend Lizzie could go for a spin down to South End. Tucker was in a difficult position. Tate was his best friend and a fully grown man. You couldn't treat him like a child. But then again, Tate had only been out of prison for a couple of weeks and was smack bang in the middle of his hedonistic bender where he was burning a candle at both ends and living life to the limit, rather like an irresponsible teenager. So irresponsible in fact that despite the fact he was driving his best friend's valuable and cherished sports car, Tate had spent most of the day indulging in his favourite cocktail, Special K and cocaine. The result was inevitable. On the edge of the A127, he lost control and smashed head first into a set of railings, instantly converting Tucker's pride and joy into a twisted heap of scrap metal. By then, Tucker had heard it still had been arrested, but he had no idea what was going on. When Tate phoned to tell him about his car, he started ranting and raving, screaming out abuse. That fucking bastard, all he's trying to do is impress some silly young tart. Tucker was even more pissed off because Tate, still high on the drugs cocktail, couldn't stop giggling. Even when he explained that he'd been arrested on suspicion of having stolen the car, driving without insurance and driving under the influence, he'd break into a big belly of laughs every few sentences. Then to rub salt into the wounds, a still giggling Tate asked whether Tucker wouldn't mind getting into his other cars, driving down the South End police station and giving him a lift home. Under the circumstances, it was almost a pleasure for Tucker, on his arrival, to tell Tate that Steele had been arrested. Although Tucker stood to lose some cash, Tate had put more than £55,000 in the deal, most of it borrowed from the notorious Jones's brothers. If the deal had gone belly up, Tate was going to have to find the cash to repay the debt right away. Tate went very quiet. Revenge. Tucker then said he'd arrange for someone to come and get him before slamming the phone down and calling Craig Rolfe. By the time we got there, it was obvious that Tate knew about Steel being arrested. Rolfe's girlfriend, Donna Jaggers, told the police later. He had the most money in the deal and he was anxious to find out what was going on. He couldn't make the call when he was banged up, so as soon as he got in the car, he grabbed Craig's mobile and called Jackie Street. She told him that everything was safe and immediately he seemed to calm down a lot but it only lasted a few minutes. Once he was sure his investment was safe, Tate soon began to get hyped up once more. He demanded to know if Rolf had any more cocaine or ecstasy on him, and then insisted they make a detour to find some. When Jaggers protested that she and Craig had plans for the evening, Tate suddenly exploded in a fit of rage. He started smashing his fists up and down on the dashboard, screaming at the top of his lungs that all he wanted was a good time, and they shouldn't be so uptight. It was like watching a kid having a tantrum. Then Tate started bragging about all the deals he had in place, about how rich he was going to be in just a few days time, how he was going to set up his own smuggling ring with his brother and hire a new cheaper pilot than Steele to bring the stuff over, how he was going to get a bigger house, a brand new Merc, how he'd even buy Tucker a new Porsche to make up for the one he trashed. Whatever planet Tate was living on, it certainly wasn't Earth. Just after 6pm, more than 12 hours after being arrested, Jack Wimes found himself sitting opposite customs officer Rodney Sales. Having been friendly and talkative earlier that morning, when he thought he might be able to bluff his way out of trouble, Wimes now resorted to a classic criminal technique, the no-comment interview. Right, Mr Wimes, what I want to ask you about the events at about 3 o'clock, half past 2 this morning, but really I want to start yesterday afternoon, and I want to start with the other people if I may. Do you know Michael John Steele? Silence. Is that no reply? If it's going to be a no reply, can you say no reply or it will be all me? Jack cleared his throat. No comment. No comment. All right. Do you know Gordon Edward Stevens? No comment. Do you know Peter Corey? No comment. I feel bloody stupid asking you this, but do you know your brother John? Wimes. No comment. Now come on, Jack. Surely you know your own brother. No comment. And so it went on for the remainder of the seven-minute interview. Michael Steele 
had little short of a lifetime's experience of interview rooms behind him. He knew his rights, and he knew the law only too well. And as customs officer Richard Hills was about to find out, with a villain of that calibre, unless you've got a cast iron case on the table in front of them, they'll never admit anything, and they'll make your life hell for even daring to try. Right, Mr Steele, Hills began. You were arrested at Felixstowe Ferry this morning. What were you doing there? Let me explain something to you before you go any further. Yesterday morning, I think I was asked my name and address six times by different officers. Now, that one little bit of information has led me to being arrested and charged with a serious offence. I was brought to this police station, strip searched, put into a cell, no ventilation, no urinal, no drinking water, no bedding. Furthermore, I would like to explain to you at this moment right now that I have nothing whatsoever to say to you for this simple reason. You've arrested me on what I'd call a trumped up charge and anything I say now in answer to your questions will be no comment. No comment, no comment. And to save yourself and me any further time wasting, I'll explain to you now that I don't intend to answer any questions. I've done anything wrong and the reason I'm not answering any questions is because of the way I've been treated. Yes, but now therefore, I'm going to answer no more questions as of now and for anybody who reads or listens to this tape later on orally or in a transcript, I don't want to sound unreasonable by sitting here being quiet whilst you pop question after question to me. I tell you now, I'm not answering any of your questions. I've no intention of doing so. I've no need to answer your questions. I've done nothing wrong. And like I say, so far all I've done is give six people my name and address that's landed me up in here. Nothing further, nothing more to say to you as of now. And that was that. Still refused to utter another word throughout the remainder of the eight minute interview. Finally, it was the turn of Peter Corey, with Richard Hills doing the honours once again. At first it seemed like Corey might be the weak link with the loose tongue. He was offered a solicitor, but declined, wrongly assuming that the customs officer would believe he had nothing to hide if he didn't want one. But not having an opportunity to speak to the others and find out what stories they were giving out, he soon realised he was painting himself into a corner. OK, began Hills. You was arrested this morning at Felixstowe Ferry in the early hours of the morning. What were you doing there? I was coming in on a boat. What sort of boat was that? Diving boats. I don't know the names. I just went out in them. Right. I take it that boat is not your property then. It's definitely not mine, no. Whose is it? As far as I know, it's Mr Steele's. And what was the purpose of your trip in the boat? He put a lot of work into it. And he wanted to go out and test the computer on board, whatever it is. I think, and he said, do you want to come out? And I said, yes. I see. Did you launch the boat from Felixstowe Ferry? Where's Felixstowe Ferry? It's where you was arrested last night. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. After that, Corey's answers to Hill's questions became more and more vague until he finally realised that he was making the situation far worse and requested for a solicitor. 40 minutes later, Corey was in the hot seat with a new attitude and confident responses to the questions. I've said all I'm going to say, he told Hills, bringing the proceedings to an unexpected premature end. Later that evening, the news came back from the customs forensic lab that cannabis resin had been found on the deck of the boat, but it was no cause for celebration. The total weight was 266 milligrams. It wasn't enough to charge somebody with personal possession, let alone with smuggling. It wasn't even enough to roll a decent joint. The Range Rover had been examined and it was clean. Customs had no choice but to let the trio go.